Well, last Sunday morning we were beginning to look at some of the biblical solutions to the synoptic problem. And in doing that, we were looking at some of the claims of form criticism. And there are a couple of basic ones we were looking at. And the one we really want to concentrate on again this morning in looking at the biblical answer, it's a fourfold answer, but we'll start on our way, is that they deny that there is any real lasting benefit from the eyewitnesses of the accounts and life and ministry of Jesus. They deny that the eyewitnesses played any significant role. And what we ended up by saying was that <clears throat> if one of your theories, and one of theirs is, one of their most important theories is the theory of oral tradition or transmission, if one of your theories bases a whole lot on the transmitting orally of the story, then who would be better than the eyewitnesses to begin that whole account? If you lose the eyewitnesses as the first link in that chain, you pretty much destroyed the outcome then. And of course, that's what we have according to them. We have gospels that are not reliable, gospels that do not tell us the original story as it really happened. But we have gospels that are filled with myths and fables and traditions that have been read into the original account. And so many of them have been read into the original account because of the needs of the community uh, in which that gospel is being composed. So that is one of their most important presuppositions, the presupposition of oral tradition, and then they short-circuit themselves and they really kill their own theory by denying any significant role among the eyewitnesses. <laughs> and the other important presupposition of most of these uh, alleged or proposed solutions to the problem is the documentary source presupposition. The gospel writers got their material from either oral tradition or transmission or earlier written documents, documentary sources. And both of these go pretty much hand in hand. They are the basic crunches on which liberalism stands today or leans, tends to lean away, maybe I should say, from the possibility of a supernatural origin or character of the synoptic gospels. Now, we're not faulting documentary sources, oral tradition. Uh, much of what the critics say is right. Their conclusions are wrong. Their conclusions are wrong. Oral tradition does play a role. You see that on our outline, and documentary sources play a role. You'll see that in our study also. But they end with wrong conclusions. And we saw a few weeks ago that one of the most important and one of the most recent theories has been called the four-document theory. The four document theory. Now, do you remember what that was? Someone wanted to come up and diagram that for us? <laughs> well, I asked you, did you know? And everyone said, yeah, we know what it is. You know as long as someone else tells you what it is. <laughs> do you have it memorized? Four document theory? J E D P. That's Old Testament, sister. Documentary sources. Someone want to try? No one wants to try? Brother Anderson, you spoke up. Oh, here's one back here in the back. Okay, we're going to... This will be your quick test for this morning, then. See if we can get... And you critique what he has up there. No, I don't have a diagram here. You can't look over here now. Somebody's got to help me with the first one. I can't remember what it was. You got the first one. Is that the first one? That's the first one. Okay, Mark was okay. No, no. Do what you know. Just okay, do what you okay. know. I'll do, I'll do. <laughs> now you got to be able to do this without looking it up. a lot of little boxes and errors in this diagram to remember. <laughs> the important thing is really not to be able to copy this, but if you understood really thoroughly what the arguments are, you'd snap this off in an instant. <laughs> 
because you'd say, all right, now I've got to have a source for this, I've got to have a source for the narratives, and I've got to have a source for the sayings of Jesus, and then I've got to have earlier um, unrelated sources for each of the ones, and then I've got to remember that Luke didn't come into contact with a certain source until after he had done some other things, and once you know all that, then you can whip that diagram out in a hurry. All right, he's got across the top M, Mark, Luke, Q, and across the bottom, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and lines from M to Matthew and Mark to Matthew. Luke and Q to the mystery box. <laughs> Why do we do these diagrams? Well, it helps the children remember, if not the adults. <laughs> <laughs> they have faster attention than adults, I think. I think I'm missing some arrows. <laughs> I got too many arrows? Keep going, whatever you can remember, brother. Proto-Luke. Proto-Luke. <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> That's a good name for it. Pseudo Luke. By the pseudo scholars. <laughs> you want someone to help you? Okay. Okay. Who wants to help? Me? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Someone up here want to correct? You tell me what to array. Well, I just have L here. Okay, L, L. I put, first of all, I put Q over here and put L over here. It's easier in the mirror. Is that what you have here? Mark it all. All right, so we got to have some cues input for Matthew. Mark, I wouldn't even have Mark on there. Mark would be Okay. So why don't we move Luke so we have him over underneath the other one? And put Luke down here. So what we're trying, what we're arguing here, and I've got some more errors that I'll need, but I'll explain that whenever we get there. What we're arguing, what they're arguing from this, some of it's true, some of it's not true, but they have some, they have some problems, and they're trying to find a solution to it. And they're right about some, well, problems. They're right about some questions or situations. They, I believe, are wrong about the solutions. You, you'd start with the understanding. You start with Mark always that 90 whatever, three or 97 percent of Mark is found in both Matthew and Luke. And so much of Mark that is found is narrative material. All right, so somehow you've got to get, somehow you have to get a situation A, B, C, like this, where B equals Matthew, C equals Luke, A equals Mark, and Mark is used by both of them. So all right, that takes care of some of the narrative material. Then the scholars studied Matthew and Luke some more, and they said, but there are so many other agreements between Matthew and Luke, very, very good agreements between the two that are not found in Mark. So we've got to find another source for them. And so they named it source, quell in German, Q for short. Quell means source. But they realize, but somehow that quell has been shaped, especially as you find it in Luke. And then Luke has some things that are not in Mark, and they're not similar to Matthew. Therefore, they must not be in Q either. They, they are peculiar to Luke himself. Therefore, they would posit an L up here. And so an L has given us a Luke, and they posit an M, and an M has given us a Matthew. All right, then Luke, once he wrote his uh, first draft, or whatever you want to call it, some of the original ideas he had, then Q um, has some input to that. You end up with Proto-Luke. After he's written Proto-Luke, then he discovers this document called Mark. Then Mark inputs and feeds what he has from Proto-Luke, and you end up with your final Luke. All right? And the same thing with Matthew. Matthew gets from M, from Mark, and from Q. Four document theory. You understand a lot of the principles behind that. It's rather easy to draw.
Uh, okay, so that's the four document theory. That's not only documentary in origin, but it is oral tradition as well. Matthew and Luke got their M's and L's, and they both got this Q from somewhere. Someone had to be saying something or passing something down. And so it's often held that uh, what was passed down was passed down by oral tradition or oral transmission. Now, I had someone tell me here during the week after we taught last week's message that in uh, John Davis's book, Foundations of Evangelical Theology, I know a lot of you picked this up whenever it was on sale. It's a really fascinating book. It's well worth owning because it covers so much material, covers so many brief introductory things in theology today. And I would have never guessed it would have covered the synoptic question, but it does. Page 210. Starting on page 210, um, Davis is referring to a man by the name of Norman Perrin, I'm not aware of him, um, whom he calls a New Testament scholar in the Bultmannian school. So he's one of Bultmann's disciples. And I just thought you'd find this paragraph interesting as confirmation for what I said last week. The last paragraph on the bottom of page 210. Perrin makes a number of very questionable assumptions in his approach. He assumes that the early church had little or no interest in a biography of Jesus, but only in what the Christ of faith, quote-unquote, was saying to the church. That's the old German uh, neo-Orthodox dividing asunder between history and Geschichte, the Christ of faith versus the Christ of history. This assumption is contradicted in a number of ways. The existence of numerous apocryphal gospels which attempted to supply biographical details of the life of Jesus, especially concerning his childhood, testifies to the widespread interest in the early church in this type of biographical material. Why would we have not only our gospels, four of them, but so many apocryphal ones or pseudepigraphal ones we might call, unless people were truly interested in all the details to the point maybe of making some of them up? but all of the details of the life of Jesus. And then it's this uh, sentence that's really interesting, or the next couple of sentences. Much of this gospel material was not especially relevant to the Gentile churches. You see, if, if they are the ones creating the material of the gospels and writing the gospels, we would think they would create material that would answer their own needs. But he's saying much of this gospel material was not really relevant to them. For instance, the debates on Sabbath observance. You don't find that hardly anywhere in the epistles. And yet you find it throughout the Gospels. So how did it get in the Gospels if the Gospels are created out of a life situation, the sits in Leban of the churches? Then how did that get in there? Well, they would have an answer. They would say, well, on that one occasion, that's where the Gospel writers aren't creating ex nihilo the material, but they are faithfully reporting what Jesus taught. So they would have a way around that. Well, then, the flip side of that. On the other hand, other issues of immediate relevance to the Gentile churches, for example, circumcision, is not discussed at all in the Gospels. And that's what we gave you last time as one of the best ideas, or not a proof text, but a proof idea against this business of the Gospels being created ex nihilo. If they were created, we know what their concern is, circumcision. And they created the Gospels, and the Gospels don't record any uh, circumcision material except favorable material. Jesus was circumcised, and he said that it goes back not to the law, but to Abraham in John 7, 22. So that would kind of be self-defeating. He goes on, if the Gospel material was created on the spot to satisfy theological concerns, one would expect the composition of the Gospels to be different in the foregoing aspects from what one actually finds. In other words, what he's saying is the Gospels are a true, um, valid, faithful representation of the life and ministry of Jesus. Okay, so this morning what I want to really start into is the fourfold biblical answer. We're going to start with number one this morning. Complete that, we'll be on two next time. Number one on your outline is direct knowledge. And if you're wondering why we spent all the last week and now a few moments this morning on eyewitnesses, well, that's why. Direct, direct knowledge. We're talking about eyewitness knowledge. Now, that could be a part of oral tradition, but it'd be the first link in the chain. 
And as the first link in the chain, and as it being the link of eyewitnesses, it would certainly be the most important aspect of oral tradition. So we're separating it from oral tradition, and we'll study oral tradition as number two or second link. Now, remember the critics believe, the form critics believe that there were eyewitnesses, but they don't put hardly any emphasis on the eyewitnesses at all. Why? Because the eyewitnesses, quote unquote, are reporting miracle stories, and miracles by their own definition can't happen. You can't witness something that's impossible. So they have to say there were eyewitnesses, but they didn't give us much of the gospel material unless it was, you know, the boring part where Jesus said something or went somewhere. Whenever he did something, did a work, well, he didn't really do works because you can't do miracles. That would be an impossible situation, <laughs> which is the whole point of the gospels, that he did the impossible, Amen. that the things that are impossible with man are possible with God. And the form critics don't like that, so they tell us some other people, later generations, are the ones who wrote the myths and fables and embellished the material. But this is important to start with. Three of the gospel writers and two of the synoptic writers were eyewitnesses of many things which they wrote. And we're going to look this morning at the tremendous significance in the New Testament given to eyewitnesses and eyewitness accounts. It played a crucial role in the birth and early growth of the Christian church. Three of the gospel writers and two of the synoptic writers were eyewitnesses of many of the things which they wrote. That's 75%, three out of four of the four gospel writers. Two out of three of the three synoptic writers were eyewitnesses. The New Testament places a lot of emphasis on that. It insists <clears throat> that the material be spread by word of mouth and be spread and later written down and be spread by eyewitnesses. Those men, of course, being Matthew, Mark, and John, three gospel writers, two synoptics, Matthew and Mark. <clears throat> now, the New Testament places a lot of emphasis on this. Our whole, I think what you could argue is that our whole Christianity, the New Testament, our whole experience, the validity of the truth claims made by the New Testament, that all depends upon whether or not these men are eyewitnesses of the accounts written, and then secondly, whether or not their eyewitness accounts are valid or factual or reliable. We're going to see both of those to be true. That the story that we have in the New Testament is the story of men who saw with their own two eyes and who heard with their own two ears the very things that Jesus said and did. This isn't a tenth generation looking back on. Now, we probably don't appreciate that as much today as we should, but hopefully we will by the time we're through. There are so many verses that put a big emphasis on the fact that this is the account of eyewitnesses. Now, not every single person was an eyewitness. Luke wasn't. But Luke was just as good as, as we'll see from one of his statements here later on. So many of these men, however, were eyewitnesses of what they saw. How would you like to be depending, I mean, if it's something as important as this, depending on third and fourth and eighth hand reports? They might have their place. And let me say this, it'd be okay to depend on third and eighth hand reports if they got it in the beginning from someone who was an eyewitness. You see, the liberals, the critics, they like this oral tradition stuff because that's the way you can end up with a lot of mess and a lot of confusion on your hands. A lot of people spread stories and it got all confused and messed up and then they finally put it down. They love that oral tradition business. We love that oral tradition too. The Bible teaches that. But the Bible, first of all, makes a big thing to do about how that whole process began. It began not in the eighth generation. It began in generation number one. It began with the original disciples and apostles who saw the Lord and who heard the Lord. They not only heard what he taught, heard what he said, but they saw what he did. They were eyewitnesses of all of the events that the Gospels record. Once we can say that and start with that, we're on firm support then for oral tradition. You're not on any support for oral tradition. Whenever you deny the validity or the reliability or any significant role 
for the eyewitnesses. You're not on any support at all. You pull the rug out from underneath your own self. So if you turn over to John's gospel, we'll look at some things that John had to say, and then Paul, and then Peter, and then Luke. That doesn't mean these were the only eyewitnesses or that these that I mentioned were all eyewitnesses. They weren't all, and there were other. But it's with these four writers in particular, uh, John, Paul, Peter, and Luke, that we have so many specific statements recording the importance of eyewitnesses or that they were. In John's Gospel, John chapter 1, of course, we know John was an eyewitness because he was one of the original 12 apostles. But in John 1 and verse 14, now I'm not going to give you all the verses you could find, just the most important ones, but once you kind of see the language used in some of these verses, then you'll be able to spot others yourself in your own reading. Uh, let's go a little earlier. John tells us in verse 10 that he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born. I mean, this is a very important passage here, a child of God. What's that depend on? Just some mythical figure about whom the only things we know are fables? That's what you get with form criticism, a mythical figure, and you know only fables about him which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Those are strong terms right there, that he was made flesh. That's flesh as opposed to spirit. Spirit's invisible. Spirit's hard to get your hands on. Flesh is flesh. It's physical. It's visible. It's tangible. You can see it and touch it. And he dwelt among us. And look in parentheses what John said. And we beheld. Now we beheld. That may be an editorial we, John speaking of himself, but even if that were true, we know that the we in the final sense is a plural. Because he, it wasn't an I beheld, it was many people beheld. Even Pilate beheld. He wouldn't give a faithful witness or testimony to what he beheld, but even Pilate beheld. It wasn't something revealed just to, you know, an inner circle or an esoteric group of men. All the people around Jesus saw it. Only some saw him for who he was, but they all saw it. And we beheld his glory. Hallelujah. His doxa in the Greek, or kavod in the Hebrew. His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. They saw him. <coughs> Now, I think whenever we would maybe study in some other area, we would probably say something along this line that I'm sure Jesus as a man in his physical appearance was not outstanding. I think that would have been rather self-defeating to the whole gospel movement and purpose and maybe contradictory to the word. God doesn't choose the beautiful and the strong and the powerful and the noble. He chooses the weak, the base, the despised, the ordinary, I don't think Jesus was outstanding or he would have won people like old Saul won people back in the Old Testament head and shoulders above everyone and so good looking but he didn't last very long though did he his good looks didn't do very much for him he was a strapping powerful head and shoulders that must mean what about six seven or six eight? Oh, what a powerful man this warrior Saul was but who was the one who lasted though that little red-haired ruddy-faced boy David Little David, who was a little nothing, is the one who lasted. I don't think Jesus would have made it on the old silver screen out west <laughs> as a movie star. He was just ordinary looking. I doubt he was ugly, but he was ordinary looking. I don't think so. so therefore, I don't think what John's talking about here is, is his physical looks, but when they saw him, there was something about him. You know, you can see someone who's ordinary looking, and they're extraordinary to you, like your wife or your husband. <laughs> There's something special about them. I doubt you'd call it the glory of God, but it's something about them. If it's glory, it's loaned to them. This wasn't loaned to Jesus. This is inherent in him. This is his. This is his from the beginning of creation. We beheld his glory. 
They saw his glory. What was glorious about him? Just him. We beheld his glory. They saw it. Therefore, you see, John starts off his gospel this way. I think I'm going to trust what John has. He saw it. He was an eyewitness of these things. You either have to say, I trust John, or I think John's a liar. And the critics have chosen neither one of those. Amen. They've said, John, yeah, he was an eyewitness, but he didn't, anything he recorded wasn't something he witnessed. Or the things that are recorded in his gospel, if they're anything beyond, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4, couldn't be recorded by John. If it's a miracle, like chapter 2, <laughs> wedding feast at Cain of Galilee, that wasn't written by John. Why? Because you cannot turn water into wine. That goes against the, quote, laws of nature. So you see where the critics are. They start way back in these presuppositions that deny God and deny him his power and deny him his sovereignty. Of course you can't turn water into wine, but God can. He can do anything. If, if, if You have to believe that if you believe in him. The two go together. All right, you see what we've said about the form critics. They don't believe in God. You have to believe in miracles if you believe in God. That, that is God by definition. He's supernatural. If he made the worlds and he can turn, if he made water and made wine, he can turn one into the other then. Amen. That'd be easy for him. It'd be more difficult to create the water in the first place mm -hmm. than just quickly shift the chemicals in it or the compound so it changes from one state to another. How about bringing something from nothing into something? That, that's the miracle of it all. A little water into wine, that's nothing. Raising the dead, that's nothing. Creating a body that you can give life to and then die and then raise from the dead is the miracle. Amen. And remember what Tillich said later in his life, I don't pray anymore, I just meditate. That makes a lot of sense. You don't pray, there's no God. That's exactly where either you start with and your theories lead you or where your, or your theories go from there or where your theories lead you. You may believe in God to begin with, but eventually your theories talk you out of that. Later in John's Gospel, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, I'm going to give you all the significant verses that you'd want to meditate on. We've got a factual, faithful narrative because these men saw it happen and they told us what they saw. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. Signs he did in their presence. Not just teachings. They like the teachings. Okay. Not the signs, not the deeds, not the narrative, not the miracles. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. Which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Then in John 21, in verse 24, This is the disciple which testifieth of these things. Or maybe the New International Version says something like, Bears witness to these things. And who wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And we know that his testimony is it's true. Then over in 1 John 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, ear witnesses and eye witnesses, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's coming against what we call the uh, docetic heresy, and to come against that, he has to emphasize the fact that he is an eyewitness, an ear witness of all the things that Jesus said and did. And Jesus wasn't a phantom. He wasn't a spirit. He wasn't a ghost. He was a real man with flesh and blood and bones. Then Paul, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 to 8, gives us his own testimony of the importance of eyewitnesses. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 8. And over in Galatians 1, we won't turn there, but in Galatians 1, somewhere around verse 14, he talks about the fact that he went to Jerusalem uh, shortly after his conversion, and he didn't see many apostles, but he saw a couple, Peter and James, the Lord's brother. Of course, that is a chapter where he denies that the origin of his message is from humans, but it's from Jesus Christ 
but surely he talked with a couple of the apostles and heard something from them, learned something about the original account. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, uh, we read that he, well, we need to go back to 3 and 4. This is kind of like a little confessional in the early church. Uh, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That he died, that he was buried, that he rose. All right, verse 5, that he was seen. By Cephas, that's Peter's Aramaic name, that he was seen by Peter. Then he was seen of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about 500 brethren. Why is he even recording this? But to tell us we've got historical, reliable bases for what we're preaching to you here. Amen. We're not just believing in the resurrection because we just want to believe in it or because we think it's a good thing to do or because someone thinks that they might have heard from someone who saw someone else that said that they thought that Jesus was raised. For the continuation of this Because someone thinks that they might have heard from someone who saw someone else that said that they thought that Jesus was raised. He goes right down the list. Peter saw him. The twelve saw him. He was seen at one time of 500 men. Now think in a court of law today, would you annul the eyewitness account of 500 people all at the same time? You know, it's easy to say, well, one person, they were deceived. It was a mirage. They wanted so bad to think that he was raised from the dead, they imagined that he was. That's the way the critics always explain it away. And so Paul adds on, no, that won't work. That little psychology won't work. Yet with Peter, maybe 12 men, maybe 500 who saw a mirage at the same time, the same mirage. Oh, not even the psychos are that dumb. <laughs> you're asking for a miracle then. Why not just believe the miracle that's already here? Amen. I mean, you're asking for a miracle. You know, you can hardly convince anyone of the little dreams or impressions you have <laughs> because they look at you. It's an impression or a dream or a vision. How about 500 people having a vision at the same time? Jesus, and they saw him. Gee, 500 all at the same time. That'd be mass delusion on our hands. Verse 6 again, after that he was seen of about 500 brethren. He doesn't mean, you know, one at a time, because you could discount them one at a time. 500 brethren at once. Somewhere, probably up in Galilee, he said, go there. I've said before I died, I would meet you there afterwards. 500, probably on a mountain. 500 disciples of his. 500 of them saw him at once. And then... Paul adds this sign for any doubters or skeptics in the Corinthian church, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. In other words, the implication is obvious. If you don't believe me, go ask them. Amen. Probably most of them live down in Palestine still. He said the majority of them are still alive today. It's one way of helping us date 1 Corinthians, by the way. Couldn't have been written in 450 A.D. <laughs> These guys were over 300 years old then. <laughs> or as the critics say, I think that's probably 2nd century second century these men are a couple of hundred years old then most of them he said are alive under the present but he said some of them are falling asleep so some have died after that he was seen of james then of all the apostles and last these are different appearances he mentioned the 12 already earlier but this is another appearance and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time and where was that, that he was seen of Paul? Well, on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me or in me. And then Peter gives us his testimony. There's John's and there's the Apostle Paul's. Peter, in a couple of places, like in 1 Peter 5, 1, he writes unto the elders that are among you, I exhort, and he describes himself three different ways then in that verse. 
who am also an elder, secondly, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, 1 Peter 5, 1, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, Peter is, he's writing to some of the elders, some of the early church leaders, and he's telling them, I also am an elder, a leader in the church. And then he gives three bases for that, three reasons um, upon which he can base his claim. He said, I'm an elder, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And I'm a partaker like you of the glory that shall be revealed. A witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter saw that. A witness. We're after this word witness, remember. He was a witness of those things. He saw those things. And we believe that his testimony is true. Remember in the end of John, the writer there is saying that this is a man who testified of these things. And we believe that his testimony is true. Some people believe that the last verse or so in John wasn't written by John, but some of his disciples. And that makes some sense because whoever's writing that, it's almost as though they're looking back on the author of the book, saying we believe that his testimony is true. Again, it could be an editorial we, him speaking of himself, but it could be the other as well, I suppose. Well, you know what the critics will do with a verse like 1 Peter 5, 1, though? They say, no problem. Peter was a witness of the sufferings of Jesus well, they already believe that the account of the passion and crucifixion is basically reliable. It's the miracles they don't like. Notice this doesn't say anything about the resurrection of Jesus, just a witness of the sufferings of Jesus. So that's okay as long as you're not, you can't be a witness of things that can't happen. You see, that's their whole argument here. You can't witness something that doesn't happen. Miracles don't happen. Therefore, you couldn't have an eyewitness of a miracle. Could have Christ have suffered? Well, certainly he could have suffered. So we can have eyewitnesses of that but not an eyewitness of any of his events or any of the miracles surrounding his life. So go to the next chapter then. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Now, if you want to remember one verse in all of this study the last few weeks, it's this verse. 2 Peter 1, 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Hallelujah. That's the whole claim of some of these scholars is that we've got a lot of fables here. That we've got fables or myths in the Gospels. And Peter categorically denies that. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses. What? Eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter's not getting something second or fourth hand. And what is in the gospel that was influenced by him, which was the second one, Mark, second in our order, according to 1 Peter 5, 13 and some early church references, what was in the gospel influenced by him came from him. And it's true and it's valid. We haven't followed cunningly devised fables. There are some out there. We didn't follow those up. When we made known unto you the coming and power or the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, we need the context, so let's get the next couple of verses in. We'll get our context of what they were an eyewitness of. See, in 1 Peter 5, 1, well, it was just a narrative, the sufferings of Jesus, so you could have been an eyewitness of that. Well, let's see what exactly he's talking about. In verse 16, he makes uh, reference to the power and to the coming of Jesus Christ. Well, he must mean the second coming of the Lord. Then in that verse, he makes reference to his majesty. Both of them refer to the same thing. Well, we'll get into verses 17 and 18. We find out what that thing is. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. What's he talking about there? The Mount of Transfiguration. If you've got a miracle on your hands, there's a miracle. Moses and Elijah coming back. Coming back in a visible form. What's he talking about in verse 16? The power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the second coming of the Lord. And the Mount of Transfiguration is like a type of that. 
Because what do you have there but a second coming of Moses and Elijah? The power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Remember how his garment shone whiter than any fuller on earth could make them? He shone with the brilliance of the sun, his majesty. He received from the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, the mount of transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. So Peter tells us in no uncertain terms, in so many different phrases here in these three verses, that, to give it as the end of 16 has, he was an eyewitness. He was an eyewitness. Well, he certainly says we, and there were some others on that mountain also, Peter and James and John. Peter and James and John. James, that James, has been dead some time now. He dies back early in Acts chapter 12. But John outlives Peter. He's still alive. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They were eyewitnesses. So you see how many verses there are so far in the New Testament that put a big emphasis on the fact this story is reliable because it came not by fourth generation, but it came from men who saw these things happen. And then Luke gives us some references over in the book of Acts. He places a big emphasis on them being eyewitnesses. Book of Acts starting in chapter 1, as a matter of fact. Starting in chapter 1. And verse 3, you see what the critics have are the apostles probably scratching their heads wondering whether or not they're sane. They thought they saw some miracles. You know, the only time that they weren't for sure, places like Acts 12, where Peter wasn't for sure what was happening to him, they became sure with reflection. It became certain in their mind as they look back on it later, well, what was it that happened? Peter supposed he saw a vision, but it wasn't. It was a true angel who released him from prison, remember. If the scholars are telling us the truth that all these accounts back in the Gospels are not really true or not really reliable, then you've got the apostles scratching their heads. They said they were eyewitnesses of it. <laughs> They're wondering what's going on then. You know, I guess we were absent-minded. We thought we saw this, and it's account after account after account. Well, we thought we saw this, and they don't really see it, the critics tell us. It's like, it uh, reminds me of an experience I had this morning, as a matter of fact, at the breakfast table. I'd gotten up early before the children and I sat down at the table with a bowl of uh, milk and cereal. I was going to eat a bite and look at some papers I had before me. And as just as I sat down, before I put the bowl down on the table, I remember kind of yawning and stretching. And then I, you know, set the bowl down to open my eyes and I feel something wet on my leg. There is milk everywhere. And I thought, I didn't remember filling that bowl that full. You know, you start questioning your own sanity. And I remember tilting that thing up. It was all <laughs> over the table. So I put the bowl down. I went over and picked up a rag and came back and wiped it all up and got it all clean and tidy and went and put it back up and came and sat down and picked my spoon up and looked to eat. And there was milk going everywhere. <laughs> and I thought, what's going on? I couldn't imagine what had happened. You know, you're half awake and half asleep at that time. <laughs> So I pick the bowl and look up underneath it, and there's a hole in the bottom of it. There's the milk out everywhere. So I yell to my wife, woman, come in here. Throw this bowl in the garbage can. And she comes in there, and what does she do? She just stands there and laughs at me. Because she could tell what happened to me. You're questioning your own sanity. I knew I didn't make a mess on the table. And you clean it up and you come back and it's there again. <laughs> it's like someone's pulling a trick on you or something, you know. And she just stands there and laughs. And I throw that bowl in the garbage can. Well, that's kind of what we have the apostles doing. They're kind of questioning their sanity. Well, I thought, Pete, John, did, did you see what I... I guess we didn't see it. The critics said we can't see it. I guess we didn't see it then. Well, see, there's always an explanation for those things. I had an explanation, a hole. I mean, you never have a hole in the bottom of a bowl. You feel like a two-year-old eating, you know, making a mess on everything. <laughs> what alerted me to it was something wet on my leg. I knew I wasn't that young. 
So, you look down, there's milk everywhere. And I know occasionally I fill the bowl too full of milk, and then you try to walk with it, and it's just a juggling act, and it goes everywhere. And I remember when I filled it up this morning, I filled it way below the level there. I knew that I had done that. You knew that you had done that, and you're questioning your own sanity. Well, can you imagine if John or Matthew were around today, and they read some of these form critic books? Say, I thought I saw all of those things. I thought that was a miracle. I thought that came from, I guess I didn't write that. I just, I had a mirage that I wrote that. And really it was a third or fourth generation Christian that wrote that. No, they would know better. They would know there's an explanation. They'd look on the bottom of the bowl and find a hole in it. A hole in somebody's head. The information is leaking out. Luke writes in verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive. We read about this over in 1 Corinthians 15. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. He was concerned that they see him and know him. You know, it could have been, there's no question about the fact that Christianity is, is a religion of faith. But your faith has to be built on some real facts out there. And Jesus provided some real facts, provided some real proof of those facts to the first apostles and the first disciples, and then because they're faithful, reliable witnesses, he expects us to look at, listen to me here, he expects us to look at these facts and believe them as though we saw them with our own eyes. He doesn't expect us just to, well, and you don't ever know whether these things happened or not, and just kind of believe. No. He expects us to believe with the same type of faith that the first apostles had when they saw it happen, that we can see through their eyes that these very events took place. You see, Jesus could have, you know what, died, gone into the tomb, and kind of spiritually resurrected and gone back to the throne of God, kind of like, uh, you know, Muhammad did or something. But Jesus gave for 40 days many infallible proofs that the one who had died was the one who was now alive. Amen. He could have just gone immediately to heaven and stayed there and expected all of his apostles to have trusted the word that he gave before he died, that I'll raise in three days, I'll resurrect in three days. That would have been enough. We would have had to have believed that if he gave that to us, but he didn't. He went beyond that. Thank you, Lord. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. You get that, remember, in the end of those gospel accounts matthew mark luke and john you get it in the beginning of acts here being seen of them now he showed himself he was seen of them 40 days and they heard him eyewitnesses ear witnesses speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of god then in verse 8 he tells them ye shall receive power after the holy spirit has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me Witnesses on him. That is, people who could go out and witness, testify to the fact that they had seen the Lord. Witnesses unto me. In the same chapter, verses 21 and 22, we read that one of the qualifications for the selection of the successor to Judas, who died that he might go to his own place, was what? He had to be something. Look in verse 22. They didn't just pick someone who kind of agreed with them or had an unction. Beginning from the baptism of John, that goes way back to the very beginning of his ministry. Under that same day that he was taken up from us, must one become a witness with us of his resurrection. <clears throat> this is an interesting verse to let us know what we would already know. From places like Luke 10, he sent out not only 12 in Matthew 10, but 70 in Luke 10. 500 brethren saw him, 1 Corinthians 15 at one time. That means there were a whole lot of disciples. Now, when I say a whole lot, I mean proportionally small in number to all that didn't follow him, but large in that we're not talking about 5 or 10 or 15 or 200 or 500. There were probably several thousand early original disciples who believed in him because look here's one uh verse 20 or two in verse 23 they appointed two joseph called barsabas who was surnamed justice and matthias two of them 
who had been with Jesus how long? Since the baptism of John. That's back to Matthew 3. Maybe a part of the 70, we don't know. But two men who had been with him from early on and who had been with him so long they continued with the band right up to the end and they were witness of his resurrection. Then in chapter 2 and verse um, 32, Peter is the one doing a lot of the talking in these places, but remember Luke is recording it, and Luke is the one who uh, wrote verse 3 anyway. Jesus said verse 8, but Luke is recording some of this. Uh, Acts 2.32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Whereof we are all witnesses. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. We'll just get down to the end there real quickly. Whereof we are witnesses. In chapter 4 and verse 20, Peter said, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I would rank that verse with the one over in 2 Peter 1.16. 2 Peter 1.16 is so good because it's one verse where Peter, in no uncertain terms, denies that they're following any cunningly devised fables about Jesus' life. They're not telling fables when they tell the miracle stories. They're telling actual, literal, scientific facts that really happened. Uh, Acts 4.20 is another good one. You might have never really understood what Peter meant by this. And now you do. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. All the things they saw and heard about Jesus. Then in chapter 5, verses 29 through 32, getting down to that last verse, but he's been talking all along about Jesus, his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. Verse 32, and we are his witnesses. Jesus said they would be in, in Acts 1, 8. Amen. You'll be witnesses unto me. We are his witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Then in chapter 10, Peter gives us so many of these, and Luke records them. Chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. Let's just jump down and catch a few of these. Verse 39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, verse 41, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God. Hallelujah. The apostles, that 500 brethren group over in 1 Corinthians 15, he didn't show himself to everyone, although his showing was an open showing. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Remember in the upper room, they had a little eating contest there to find out whether he was truly Jesus. And he said, touch me, handle me, let me eat something. Because you know a spirit doesn't have flesh and blood as you see me have. So he must have had that then in a resurrected state, but he must have had it. A spirit, you know what happens if you put something in the mouth of a spirit. There's no bottom to the stomach. It hits the floor. They saw the food go in and didn't come back out. Rather mysterious, but you couldn't say that he was a ghost or this was an apparition they were having. It was a real person before them. Not in a completely physical state like they were, but in some type of uh, visible physical existence because he ate something and he drank something and he talked with them and it was a marvel to them and peter remembers that he's looking back on that as he's preaching he remembers that it was a marvel how he ate that fish other manuscripts say he ate a fish and a piece of a honeycomb i think the better manuscripts just say that he ate a fish though <laughs> that's enough luke 24 to eat a fish you don't have to prove it by eating a honeycomb also uh, then in chapter 13 verses 29 to 32 29 to 32 
you got pretty much the same story. The end of verse 31, who are his witnesses unto the people. Just one verse after another, after another, after another, after another. But as far as the writer Luke is concerned, surely the greatest um, text that we can have in Luke's writings is back in his gospel in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It's called the preface or the introduction of Luke's gospel. And it goes like this, if you'll be turning there. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those, of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke puts a big emphasis on the fact that the story, not only that he is telling, but that others have told, goes back to the very first, to the very first. He tells us in verse 2, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Well, that would be the apostles and some of the early disciples. Uh, then he tells us in verse 3 that he had perfect understanding from the very first. Perfect understanding of all things from the very first. So he's writing in order, and someone else in verse 1 had written in order, both times in order, a declaration of those things most surely believed among us in order to this man named Theophilus so that he'll know the certainty of those things that he has earlier been taught. You pretty much have to make a mockery of a lot of these verses we're looking at if you deny any significant role to the eyewitnesses. They played the most significant role of anyone in the early church. The eyewitnesses that saw Jesus before his uh, crucifixion as well as after his resurrection. Now, let me just say something quickly about the three synoptic writers in. We're talking about three men who are giving us a reliable account. First of all, something about Matthew. Matthew was a Roman tax collector, was he not? Well, I mean, he was a Jew by birth, but he was a tax collector for the Romans. Therefore, he was probably skilled in writing. Being a tax collector, you'd have to be able to keep up with accounts and figures and things. He could easily have copied things down as he saw them and heard them in Jesus' earthly ministry. I'm just saying that he could easily have done that. Whether he did write anything down or not, he was an eyewitness of the accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. What about Mark? You say, well, Mark, he wasn't one of the twelve, like Matthew or Peter or James or John or the others. So Mark, he wasn't an eyewitness. Oh, I believe Mark was an eyewitness. Let me give you some proof for that. Uh, in Mark chapter 14, verses 50 to 52, I believe, and most scholars believe, that this is a cryptic autobiographical reference. There's really no other way you can explain it. Mark 14, verses 50 through 52 that this is a record of Mark's experience, and if it is, what it proves is that Mark was an eyewitness at least to the arrest of Jesus Christ. This is at the occasion in the garden where he is arrested, Mark 14, 15. They all forsook him and fled, that is, the apostles. But there followed him, one of his followers, there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men, that would be the Levitical temple police force, the young men laid hold on him. And he, that first young man in verse 51, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And then you just go right into another account. Well, those verses would be without <laughs> meaning at all. They would just be given to us and leave us hanging. Uh, who is this young man? unless it's an autobiographical reference to the writer Mark. I believe that this is a reference to Mark himself. There'd be no other reason to include that. Mark was there. Mark witnessed the arrest of Jesus. Now, he didn't witness what happened right after that because we're told in verse 52 he fled from them naked. But he at least was, a, was an eyewitness of the arrest of Christ. And I can think I can go further. According to Acts 12, 
verses 12 and 25. He had a home and lived in Jerusalem. We know according to these verses as well as those in the end of some of the Gospels that his mother's name was Mary and that she was a follower of Jesus and an eyewitness of much of his life. Well, it only stands to reason that her son, Mark, also was an eyewitness of these things. I would suggest that he probably had been familiar with Jesus through uh, much, if not all, of Jesus' earthly ministry. That's according to Acts 12 and 12. When he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. And then in verse 25, we see that they take John, whose surname was Mark, with them on their journey. Or they're going to end up going on their first apostolic journey. So I think Mark was an eyewitness. All right, that leaves us with Luke then. Was Luke an eyewitness? Well, no. Luke was not an eyewitness. As a matter of fact, that's part of what the preface is all about. If you notice real carefully in Luke 1, verses 1 and 2, he denies that he was an eyewitness. He said, even as they delivered them to us, he puts himself with the us and not the they, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Or he's denying his role among the eyewitnesses. He's in us, not a they. They taught them to us. We have learned those things from them. We are the us and they are the they. They are the eyewitnesses and I am not. Uh, however... He was a faithful companion and fellow traveler with the Apostle Paul. Although he didn't have direct first-hand knowledge of the gospel, he was a traveler of Paul's. Paul had much interaction with the original apostolic band and all the times he was in Jerusalem and out and back in and out and so forth. And so I'm suggesting that Luke certainly had an avenue of knowledge um, that way. Uh, however, and I have some other ways I'd like to suggest to you later when we study Luke's gospel, he tells us in verse 3 that he had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. That doesn't mean he was back there, but it means that he has an understanding of all things that started at the beginning. He has a perfect understanding of everything as it started in the very beginning. 